to this, this evening's program of the Public Health Museum. We're very fortunate to have uh, a great speaker on a very interesting topic. And uh, tonight we'll be talking about William Augustus Hinton. Uh, and the primary reason for this is that we were fortunate enough to acquire some of his laboratory papers uh, from the public health laboratory where he worked for most of his career. Uh, and we got a uh, grant from Mass Humanities through the Massachusetts Cultural Council to um, document those papers, uh, to scan them and to catalog them. Uh, and uh, that was done by Amber Woods, who whose real name is not Public Health Museum, but Amber. And she uh, did an excellent job of getting that together. And eventually those will be available on the Public Health Museum website for any scholars or researchers who want access to those papers. And, and tonight we're joined by Marion Johnson Thompson. Dr. Johnson Thompson is an emerita professor of biology and environmental sciences at the University of the District of Columbia uh, and uh, adjunct professor in uh, child and maternal health at School of Public Health University, North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She uh, did her undergraduate and master's degree in biology uh, at Howard University and then PhD in molecular virology at Georgetown University Medical School. And she taught for, I think I have this right, 21 years at the University of the District of Columbia before joining the National Institute of Environmental Health uh, Sciences at the NIH uh, and uh, was the director of the of education and biomedical research development there. While at NIH, she did extensive work in a variety of areas, in particular on STEM education in K through 12 uh, schools, as well as uh, participating uh, on the uh, NIH IRB and working to uh, towards more inclusion of um, minority populations in environmental health uh, research. She uh, started her career working on SV40 virus and uh, the uh, and and DNA of the virus, and then uh, went on to do work in breast cancer, which sort of explains the environmental health and the breast cancer work that she did. She uh, was the founder of the uh, Advanced Research Cooperation Environmental Health at NIEHS, uh, and uh, did a lot of work uh, towards uh, education for underrepresented uh, minorities in environmental science, as well as uh, in health equity and health disparities. She has received numerous awards. She's been on numerous federal and state uh, advisory commissions, committees. Uh, she currently serves on the North Carolina Secretary of Environmental Health Justice and Equity Advisory Board and the North Carolina Environmental Defense Fund. She has uh, been very active for the last 50 years, I know, uh, with the ASM on multiple committees uh, and has uh, been awarded the Alice Evans and the William Augustus Hinton uh, Award for the Advancement of a Diverse Community in Microbiology, an award, by the way, that she was instrumental in creating, which I think explains some of the interest in Hinton, probably. Uh, and um, she has also been elected a member of the American Academy of Microbiology, the American Association for the Advancement of Science as a fellow, and uh, she's an emeritus, emeritus member of the American Association of Cancer Research, uh, as well as a uh, Coleman Scholar of the Susan Coleman Foundation and a Coleman Advocate in Science. And uh, so it is a privilege to introduce Dr. Marion Thompson, Johnson Thompson this evening. She has already over the years 
uh, communicated with me and taught me a lot about uh, William Augustus Henson that I didn't know. And I, I want to express my appreciation for that and my appreciation for us for joining us this evening. Uh, we'll hold questions to the end. You can you can get ahead of the crowd if you want to put your questions in the Q&A or the chat, or you can just save them from the end. It's probably a good idea to put them in the Q&A in the chat anyway, so I know to call on you. So with, for, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Johnson Thompson. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. De Maria, and I can't tell you how grateful I am for the work that you are doing to enhance the visibility of Dr. William Augustus Hinton, as well as inviting me here tonight. I appreciate it so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to having some good discussion. So uh, you can see my title there, William A. Hinton, MD, Obscured in Life, Highly Revered in Death and hopefully you will get a better feel of how I have developed that theme. So what I like to do is to just let you know how I started this journey and then give you a brief overview of Dr. Hinton's uh, birth, education, career, death, and subsequent allocates. And I'd also, and actually this doesn't have to come in to the middle, but I want to say how significant the work that Dr. Del Maria is doing in furthering the elucidations of Dr. Hinton's work. So much of this work has been hidden. And even today I found out something else I didn't know. And then I, I'm really concerned about Dr. Hinton's personal life. That is the life between the dash. He was born in 1883 and he passed in 1959. What happened during that period in addition to his scientific pursuits? And because of that, I want to you know, just have a brief discussion on what have we learned. So uh, let me just say how I got start, started. You know, one of the nice things about being in the academic higher education environment is you always learn from your students. And I think any professor will tell you how wonderful that is. Well, around the mid 1980s, I would have a special extra credit report during Black History Month. And I would tell the students if they gave me a one pager on a microbiologist, they could get extra credit. And so this went on for three or four years. And of course, I always knew the individuals who they uh, addressed. But one student, and, and I can't tell you, I, I feel so bad that I don't recall his name, but it was in the mid eighties, he gave me a report about William Hinton. I had never heard about William Hinton before. And in his report, I learned that he obtained this information from Ebony Magazine. And it was an October 1955 issue. Now, for those of you who don't know what Ebony Magazine is, it is now out of print, unfortunately, but it was the magazine that probably every African-American family had as a coffee table book especially during that time. And it focused on the contributions of African-Americans in all areas from the fine arts to science, to medicine, uh, to sports, education, what have you. Uh, after, and that was his only reference, but it had, it said so much. And as you can imagine that student got an A plus for teaching his professor something. Uh, so I began looking for information and uh, subsequent to that, Montague Cobb, who was the editor of the journal 
of the National Medical Association. The Journal of the National Medical Association was established in 1999, 1899, because African Americans could not join the organization. And it is still uh, in 2023, a very vibrant organization. And the go-to organization for those who are interested in the health of African Americans in particular and need to know more information. Uh, the majority of your uh, practicing physicians do belong to this organization. Uh, the other, the other, and I'm, I'm just gonna run through these. Uh, there was an article in the New York Amsterdam News in 1967 that announced that this scholarship was uh, presented to Harvard and it was gonna be named after I, uh, President Eisenhower. Probably one of the best sources I had was from Robert Hayden, uh, who wrote Nine Black American Doctors in 1976. And he had a chapter on William Hinton. The next very useful source was the American Society of Microbiology Archives. And I'll tell you more about that as we go. And then eventually I actually traveled to the Countway Library in 1998 and found information. There's a wonderful, comprehensive, and a really in-depth article about, this was a thesis, I'm sorry, a thesis by an undergraduate student, Barbara Nabrit, who I've since had the opportunity to meet. And she wrote a detailed uh, thesis on uh, Dr. Hinton. She later went on to medical school and is a practicing physician. Um, and this is just a list of the individuals that I actually spoke to. All of them I met. I'm not certain if I met Hayden. I think he's the person I might have met at in Martha's Vineyard, but I cannot remember. And all of these individuals are deceased now, except neighbor. But Harold Amos, who many of you know, a former professor at uh, Harvard, Charles Watts, who was a nephew of Dr. Hinton, John Hope Franklin, um, who was an emeritus professor of history at Duke University. And it's interesting, Dr. Franklin wrote the premier book uh, back in the day that focused on uh, black history. And he had maybe three sentences about William Hinton. And I later had a chance to speak to him. He knew of him, but he didn't know much. And of course, Jane Hinton, Dr. Hinton's daughter, I had a chance to go up and visit her. His, his grandson, sorry, I got that twice. And as I mentioned, Barbara Neighbors. So the article in Ebony Magazine talked about that he had developed this accurate test for cephalus, that he had been the director of the Wasserman Laboratory for more than 38 years, that he only received a professorship at the close of his career. And it focused on the fact that he was charming, mild-mannered, strove for, for anonymity, and I have some photos later from that article that you'll be able to see. And he learned the hard way that professional progress in the medical world is not always determined by talent and achievement. That was the summary of the article. The person who really led me to Jane Hinton was Dr. Harold Amos. And uh, many of you are familiar with Dr. Amos. He received his PhD in 1952 from Harvard Medical School. And he had a number of um, accomplishments and achievements. He was a Maud and Lillian Presley Professor of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. And he chaired the Department of Microbiology twice twice he chaired that. He was the first and only African-American to chair the microbiology department at Harvard. 
he has since passed. And uh, as I mentioned, he's received many honors. And of course, he received the Memorial Minute and port his portrait was, a, uh, was unveiled in 2007 in Warren Athens building there at Harvard. Now, Harold Amos, of course, he came along much later. He had a different trajectory than William Hinton. He did not uh, remain anonymous. He spoke up, he spoke out. He was very interested in the minority students at um, Harvard and he actually uh, was their faculty advisor for the Hinton Wright uh, organization that I'll also talk about. Uh, I'm just showing you this. This is uh, Robert Hayden's book, 1976, that um, I used to gain more information from Hinton. I'm trying to go back to that slide. And uh, and then in 1992, he wrote uh, 11 African-American doctors. So this is uh, a photocopy of Hinton's book, Syphilis and its, treat and its Treatment, um, and its treatment published in 1936. And this is, uh, he's well known for this textbook. It's the first textbook written by the first medical textbook written by an African-American. And the, his contributions to, um, to enhancing what was then known as a Wasserman test was that it was a simple test, it was quick, and it was unambiguous. In those days, the Wasserman test gave a lot of false positives. And this was very, very uh, embarrassing to the um, recipient to find this out. It was standard in Massachusetts and uh, the USPH, United States Public Health Service evaluated it as topping all others. Now, this is something that I recently found in my father's textbook. The book is Clinical Diagnosis by Laboratory Methods. It was written in 1948. And this book has an entire chapter on Hinton's work. Dr. Del Maria will be interested in seeing this because I just happened to have this textbook and it did a really nice chapter on um, the Hinton test as well as the Davies Hinton test. But one of the things that I noticed in this is though Davies and Hinton worked together, the publications that came out only had a Davies name. It's very interesting that um, Hinton was not a co-author on these two publications. When I traveled, to Boston to meet with Jane Hinton during another meeting. At the last minute, she told me she was unable to meet with me, but I went to the Conway Library. And this is a very interesting piece that I found. Excuse me, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I did not find this. I found in an article at the City Library that Hinton had left money for a Dwight D. Eisenhower scholarship. And when I found that out, I then I went to, uh, I, I, I contacted, after I got back to North Carolina, I copied, uh, I contacted Harvard University and asked for information about this scholarship fund. And, uh, I also asked to know who had received it because my thoughts were that since Hinton, a black person had established this scholarship fund, then you, know, you would think that uh, African-Americans would be able to benefit. She sent me the 
information. And as you can see, it was open to all, which I have no problems with that. But when I asked who the recipients were, I, I never received that information. Um, the scholarship as it is written was established in honor of um, Hinton's parents who had been enslaved. And it further stated that though they didn't have formal education, they really appreciated the importance of it. Now, whether this statement came from Hinton is questionable. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that. So the next information I'm going to sort of run through is information that's in the Memorial Minute that was adopted by the Faculty of Medicine of Harvard University, June 3rd to 1960. Now, I focus on this because there's so much information out there now on William Hinton. Most of it appears to have been extracted from this minute. So let's go through it and briefly see what it says. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, and he received, uh, a, he went to the University of Kansas and apparently for two years and he had to drop out and work uh, to raise money and he went to Harvard. I just found out today through doing some digging that it, it, it was his professor at the University of Kansas who had contact with a professor of, at Harvard who recommended him. And that's how he ended up going to Harvard for his BS. He taught at various colleges from 1905 until 1912. In Tennessee, one was Meharry Medical. He taught anatomy and physiology there. He also taught, taught at Langston, Ohio, at Langston University in Langston, Oklahoma. He taught math and physics. And in 1909, he married Ada Hawes. Now, Ada Hawes was from Macon, Georgia. She went to Atlanta University in Atlanta, received her BS. And then she eventually went to the University of Chicago where she received her master's. She was a very um, well-learned woman and she, from all accounts contributed a lot to uh, Dr. Hinton's success. Apparently she typed the book, uh, the Cephology book he wrote. And it turns out that she was either five or six years his senior, which was a little unheard of that day and during that time. They had two children, Anne and Jane. He received the MD from Harvard and he also, and he, to, to attend ha ha Harvard, he received two scholarships. Some will say that he denied the Hayden Scholarship for color students and um, took a test to uh, qualify for the Wigglesworth Scholarship. However, it seems as though he did have the Hayden because Further documentation shows that he only had the Wigglesworth for two years. Uh, when he finished, he was denied a ten internship in Boston because of his race. And so he volunteered in the pathology lab at Mass General and uh, was invited very early on to write a chapter on Wasserman's reaction in Rosenau's textbook of preventive medicine. However, I have not been able to find that chapter. He had dual appointments uh, at the Boston Dispensary and he was chief of the Wasserman Laboratory. In 1924, he was appointed instructor. He published his book in 36. And in the Howard Medical School Bulletin in 1955, it described the Hinton test as being widely acclaimed. Unfortunately, in 1940, he had a serious car accident and uh, the documentation shows that 
he got up but then he was dragged by another car and be and because of that his leg was amputated uh, however he continued to work for another 10 years 1946 he was promoted to lecturer 49 on the eve of his retirement he was finally promoted to clinical professor of bacteriology and immunology, becoming the first African-American to receive a professorship at Harvard. In 1950, he retired from professorship, from the uh, position, and that was a mandatory retirement. At that time, you had to retire by 70 years old. However, he continued to teach and somewhat head, headed up two labs, but apparently he could not be paid for this. And in 1953, he retired completely. Uh, in summary, uh, the, the minute said that he had a meritorious and successful teaching uh, career. Uh, his, the significance of his work was a very sensitive Hinton flocculation test and he was elected life member of the American Society, the Association of the Society of Hygienists. Excuse me, I can't remember what all that is. It wasn't a scientific, it was more of a social, uh, a social organization. Um, but it said that he lived a life so intensely and so well. It, he really lived a life so intensely and so well. It's interesting that the end of the minute, uh, these are the persons who signed it. And as a microbiologist, I, I knew who these individuals were, but one struck me, I didn't know who Francis Rivers was. It turns out that Francis Rivers was a good friend of the family. He was the first black judge in Boston. And here I got a lot of information about him, but it turns out that he was very close to the Hinton family. And this was uh, substantiated by some of his relatives, some of Hinton's relatives who I subsequently met. So not cited in the Memorial Minute was Dr. Hinton's 75,000 request to Harvard for the Eisenhower Fund. The Davies Hinton test wasn't uh, mentioned. Membership in the Society of Bacteriology, now ASM, was not cited. He perhaps wasn't a member at the time, but the earliest available records at the ASM, the, Associ the Society, American Society for Microbiologists, was formed in 1899, the earliest records that remain are in 1921, and Dr. Hinton was on the list. In fact, next to his name was an individual who later became president of the ASM. In 1957, uh, Hinton was featured in and on the cover of the Journal of the National Medical Association. Uh, once again, that was the uh, counterpart to the American Medical Association. And the other interesting uh, thing about Dr. Hinton was that he really wanted to be a surgeon. And so you can imagine how not being able to uh, aspire to that disappointed him. So in 19... 99, I went back to uh, Boston. And this time I actually had the opportunity to drive out uh, and visit with Jane Hinton. And Jane Hinton is also receiving a lot of notoriety these days. She gave me this paper. Actually, I knew about it before uh, as it relates to Mueller Hinton Auger, but many of us had always thought that was William Hinton. We didn't know it was his daughter. And she gave me the paper and she said, you know, uh, 
all I did was just work in the lab for the summer and do and do the work. You know, I don't really think that I was deserving of it. But and it turns out she was 22 at the time. She had finished college, but later she went to Penn and received a DVM, becoming one of two African Americans to receive the first DVM, they did it at the same time. And uh, this is a photo of Mueller. And uh, this is an early photo of Jane Hinton. And it turns out the records show that Mueller was very helpful to Dr. Hinton in terms of his work, supporting him. So apparently they, they had a very good relationship wherein uh, Jane uh, was able to get that summer job. And of interest too is that actually Harold Amos completed his PhD research under Dr. Mueller. So this is the article that I saw in the New York Amsterdam News. And it really uh, piqued my interest. It talked about, it talked about this scholarship. And what it said was that the fund not yet complete may eventually amount to $75,000. It, it said nothing about the fact that this money was actually left and that it was the Eisenhower Fund. But by this time, of course, I already knew that uh, as you saw from the endowment records, that it was for the uh, Eisenhower scholarship. But what intrigued me was that it said it was not complete. So when I asked Jane about this, she got very, very upset. And she told me, yes, that happened because it was the home and that he had willed his home and all the furnishings to Harvard. And once he passed within a week, she had to leave the home. Now the sister, Anne, was living in uh, New York, I believe. And she had married and had one son, the grandson, who I later met. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you about him. But I, so when she told me this, I, you know, I just got very upset. I said, what, how did that happen? She said, oh, well, we went to court to contest it, but we couldn't win. And she said, now look, don't you go around talking about this because I don't want those Harvard people coming to question me. So I gently told her, I said, well, I won't let those Harvard people come and bother you. And what that meant is that I would not say anything in such a way that they could do that. And of course I kept my mouth closed. And I'll come back to that, but I just want to continue a sequence of events following his death. Probably uh, the first, recognition that he received after that was in 1974 when the serology lab of the Department of Public Health was named the William A. Hinton Serology Lab. And at that um, occasion, Bernal Cave, who was the president of the National Medical Association at that time, gave the keynote address. And then in 1988, under Dr. Harold Amos's sponsorship, the Harvard Medical School students established the Hinton Wright Society. Wright was a physician who finished Harvard Medical three years after Hinton. They had somewhat of a friendly relationship, but Wright was just the opposite in his trajectory. He was unable to get a an internship in Boston. 
but he went to Howard University, did an insur internship and became extremely successful, widely noted, and was a real advocate for the rights of black people. In fact, at one point he served as the NAACP, NAACP president. And none of his involvement in activism impacted his success as a physician. Now, I want to really give credit to the American Society of Microbiology at this time, because as you saw in the previous slide, that was 1974. And it was the American Society of Microbiology which took the national lead in bringing attention to William A. Hinton. And yes, it was because I was a member of the society and I was able to urge uh, the ASM archivist to search files for information on Hinton. At the same time, Kessler at, and all um, published a book, Distinguished African-American Scientists of the 20th Century, which included Hinton, but not really anything new. But I thought it important just to identify him as another individual who contributed to uh, spreading the word about Hinton. And so what we found, as I mentioned before, that Hinton, this was in 1997, Hinton paid dues in 1921, 1921, but never attended meetings. And of course, this was the case because in most of the meetings that they were held in the South, you, you couldn't go into the meeting rooms, you couldn't stay in, well, you could go into the meeting rooms, but you certainly couldn't stay in the hotel. And, um, in 1997, Hinton was cited in the February ASM News, now called Micro, and he was featured on ASM's Heroes posters that went out to tens of thousands of elementary school students. In 1972, it was recommended that ASM develop the, an award in Hinton's name. It was done in 1998. And uh, the first recipient was named. And in 1999, at ASM Centennial Celebration, Hinton was placed on the cover. Now, here is the first article in 1997 by my former mentor, Jim Jay, and I, wherein we discussed William Hinton's uh, contributions. This shows the ASM award that is given out yearly uh, in honor of Dr. Hinton. And sorry, this is so bad. This is not a good copy. It turns out I did not save the book. I did pull off the cover of this meeting that was held in 1999. Once again, it was the uh, centennial anniversary. And uh, here is Hinton. Uh, on the cover with various other notables. That's Alice Adams here. She was the first uh, female president of ASM. And I believe this is uh, Waxman. After that, and even though, you know, I pursued ASM, in establishing this award and really bringing recognition to Hinton, it was because of the statue that the American Society of Microbiology has in the scientific community, wherein I would just use the phrase, if ASM says something, others listen. And so after that, several uh, awards were named. Uh, one interesting piece is a, is a presentation, a paper that I did at the American, uh, the African-American, well, it's not written here correctly, the African-American study of life and history in 2007, where I discussed um, William Hinton. It was, a, it was a bit disappointing because most of the papers there were the history, 
of the civil rights movement. And there was just nothing focusing on science. So I was just sort of out of my league and it didn't seem to be much interest. And then in 2008, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health named the William A. Hinton State Laboratory. So it went from a being the lab, the Hinton lab to the Hinton building. And this was an award that was given out by Boston. And in fact, when this was established, I was contacted to uh, give the information about Hinton. And so that was probably the first time that he received recognition there in Boston. And that is just the paper that I that I gave. And then this was 2008 when the uh, Hinton Lab was renamed, the, the, it evolved into the Institute that we say. And let me say this, I show pictures because I want to establish the authenticity of what I'm saying. Um, once again, uh, going back to the Ebony Magazine article that was written in 1955. And I, I write this because I, to bring to your attention that when this magazine was operable, it was the source of information, important information within the African-American community. I further state that if that article had not been written, that student would not have made that report, I would not have found out about it. I would not have been able to go to ASM and get them to promote the visibility of Hinton. And whether or not Hinton would be held in such a high esteem, the highest esteem that he is today, I'm not certain. In that article, you see a picture here of William Hinton, and there is his cane. I learned just today through a video of an interview by one of his laboratory workers that he actually was in a wheelchair. Somehow or another, I didn't realize this because I'd always seen this photo with the cane, but she mentioned that he uh, was in a wheelchair and also that he had someone to drive him back and forth from his home in Canton. Now, once again, some of the articles that I had read said that even though he had this accident, he was able to drive himself back and forth to work. So you can see how oftentimes information is embellished and perhaps written in a way that sounds more nice or written in a way to the um, author's thinking. In that article, they also showed variety of technicians uh, photos. Now, these had to be photos that Hinton had at his home because he had retired. The other thing that I didn't emphasize was that in addition to Hinton teaching Harvard medical students, and they really loved him, uh, he always had high marks. They thought that he was just a wonderful teacher with just enough humor to make the courses interesting. But he also started a laboratory specifically for young women to learn laboratory techniques. And here you can see uh, some of the individuals working in his lab. This one is of Genevieve Stewart, who has been interviewed. And Genevieve uh, mentioned that she started right out of high school as his secretary, but he eventually brought her into the lab and taught her uh, laboratory techniques. 
And if I'm not mistaken, after his death, she moved into his position or very close uh, in proximity to the position that he held. And here you can see some other individuals, notably is a person who appears to be African-American. And here are more. Um, now, this is very interesting because only in this article was this, has this ever been said that he once declined the Howard University Medical Deanship. But it appears to be in line with Hinton's thought pattern because he also declined the Spingarn Medal that is presented by the NAACP to outstanding individuals who have contributed to the advancement of African Americans. And so this has gone to, in fact, the first one I believe was to a not white individual, but he declined that invitation. And as early as, and I think it was 38, 1938 when he declined it, but the records show and letters are available that show where W.E. B. Boats actually contacted, I think, Fuller, Dr. Fuller, and asked for a picture because he had been trying to contact Hinton and he wanted a picture, but Hinton wouldn't give it to him. And it turns out it was because W.E.B. Boyce was uh, recommending him for the Spingarn Medal. So he declined it. And the reasons given for his his, his need to remain, remain anonymous was because he felt that if it were, were known that he was black, he would not um, be successful and his work would not be accepted. Now, this is another very interesting individual, Ruth Marguerite Easterling, as you can see, African-American. And it is said, that she worked, she was a pathologist. She finished medical, Tufts Medical School. She worked as a pathologist with Hinton and also worked at the Veterans Hospital in Tuskegee. And this brings up another um, area of interest that has interested me in a long, for a long time because Hinton was a consultant to the United States Public Health Service that sponsored the Tuskegee study. And with Hinton being a, special, a specialist in syphilis, I often wondered if he was involved with that now infamous study. There are no records to show that. Um, hopefully the work that Dr. Deb Maria is doing will bring some light to whether or not he did in terms of uh, the papers that have been received and the papers that are being digitized. So that remains an unknown. Now, unfortunately, Ruth, Dr. Ruth Easterly died at a very early age. She passed in 1943. Uh, after diagnosis of breast cancer, she was 45. And there isn't much else said about her. I think Tufts has a, uh, an award in her name, but there's not much else known about her. Now I showed this because I received it many years ago. I found it online and it had to do with, um, someone in Kansas City asking Dr. Hinton for an autographed copy of his book. He wrote her back to say that he did not have a book, but that he would give an autograph. And in fact, this was on display. It can't be, find, it can't be found now, but I have looked more carefully at, at the letter and it's Kansas City, Missouri. Now it turns out when you read about Hinton having grown up and finishing high school in Kansas City, it doesn't say Kansas City, Kansas. It just says Kansas City. 
So I, at once, once I saw that, I said, well, maybe they went to Missouri, but it's unlikely. It's because before I move forward, I want to show you this authentic copy of the, the dues received by William Hinton. And now I have to, yeah, here it is, William Hinton, 1921, $5. So this was the earliest available record, which documents that he was a member at that time. So going back to the Kansas City, Missouri uh, document, it seems unlikely and apparently they did find out that he wasn't from Kansas City, Missouri. And that plaque is no longer available in, in the library. And I thought, I said, wow. I said, so if they were enslaved in North Carolina and then they went to Chicago, and they left Chicago actually because they said that living conditions were very poor. And then they went to Kansas and then back to Missouri. What, 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 what amount of traveling that was. This slide I just want to show you because it's one of the many notes that I received from Jane. And she's talking about uh, the grandson, Charlie. But the interesting thing that she says is that um, I, oh, she, that she's found what I've sent her, interesting facts and news. She says she didn't know much about her father. He never spoke of his childhood or rarely or early manhood. The only thing I heard was he ran away from home in his early teens. From there to Harvard is a mystery to me. It's a mystery to me too. And uh, it shows the complexity of this man. This slide I like because it shows uh, Dr. Hinton with his favorite pet, Heidi, and uh, this is from the Ebony article. The, the other thing that I had the opportunity to receive from a distant cousin, uh, Maxine Burney, is this piece of when he was given honorary life membership in the American Social Hygiene Association. Remember that was the ASHA that I could not remember the title. And that's a different picture, photo that we have not seen of Hinton. So in closing, I just like to recognize a few people. I am deeply indebted to Jeff Carr, who is the uh, retired ASM archivist. Uh, Jeff went through thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of, of paper because at that time, you know, things weren't digitized to give me information, not only of William Hinton, but other black microbiologists, such as Ruth Moore, who finished, uh, who was, who was the first woman to get a PhD in microbiology. She, she finished Ohio State in 1932. And interestingly enough, her name is not even listed in the listings of individuals who received the PhD there. However, I have received her thesis and Ohio State has had many, many, many uh, honors attributed to her. Uh, Lucretia McClure, I don't even know if she's still there at the Countway Library. She was very helpful to me. Uh, Hayden, who I mentioned, Howard University had a few items. Barbara Navid, Navid, uh, her thesis was phenomenal. And I would suggest this as a study for anyone because she really talked about how William Hinton sought to receive approval of not only Harvard University, 
but the white establishment to the extent that he did everything he could, including setting up his will wherein he gave everything to Harvard, including the silverware in his home. This is all written out and it went through probate court, the furnishing, the papers, and his daughter, Jane, Hen Jane was put out a week after his death. The other daughter, Anne Hinton, you should, you would probably want to know what happened to her. She was trained as a social worker. And according to Jane, a personal communication with me, she said that she actually died in the aim what they used to call an insane asylum. That was her words for it, a mental institution, Jewish mental institution. And apparently uh, Anne was a bit more vocal and forthright than uh, Jane. And uh, she had some papers because I had asked Jane if there was a personal item like glasses or something that she could give me so that we could put it on display at the ASM headquarters. That was when she told me she had nothing. Uh, she was put out of the house uh, and had managed to get a few items, but they were lost at the, at the mental institution. And of course, Harold Amos, who actually was the key person in putting me in touch with Robert Hayden, as well as with Jane, he knew Jane very well. And then of course the personal communications that I received from family members, including the grandson. Poindexter, another black, he was the first black PhD MD microbiologist who also finished Harvard uh, in his My World of Reality, which is actually his biography. He mentions um, Kenton, but apparently there was not much of uh, um, communication between the two. And so three years ago, 1919, was that three years ago? Four years ago, in 1919, Hinton um, received the highest honor of all. A portrait of him was placed in the Waterhouse Room at Harvard University, which is reserved for all the high deans of the medical school. Uh, that is where Oliver Wendell Holmes' uh, portrait is. And then later my colleague, Eric Munson, wrote a full feature on William Hinton in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, which again is an ASM journey, journal and it shows you the role that ASM continues to play in advancing uh, William Hinton. In 2020, the Oliver Wendell Holmes Society at Harvard Medical School was renamed the Hinton Society. And this was initiated by student protests in support of this name change. It turns out that in the middle 1850s, three students, the first three medical students were enrolled at Harvard, but the white students there had problems because they didn't feel comfortable with these black students in their midst. And they went to Oliver Wendell Holmes and he dispelled, he expelled the students based on the white students feeling of discomfort. And so the black students, along with all students there at, uh, at uh, Howard felt that Oliver Wendell Holmes should not have that, um, that honor. And so it was changed to the Hinton Society and everybody, including the uh, president of Harvard University agreed. This, we're ending now, this is the home where um, Hinton lived. When they bought this property in 1916, it was on four, four acres 
and the seller told them that the house was of no value, that they were just getting land. And it turns out that Hinton was a carpenter, he was a gardener, and he did most of the work on the home himself. And it was described as a very beautiful uh, home with a pond in the back. He raised, uh, he and his wife raised vegetables. Actually, they did farming and they would often share the produce with the laboratory. And so Hinton did belong to the First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church in Canton, Massachusetts. And in the memorial minute that I showed you earlier, this is where the service was held when they went there on that evening as they described it. And this picture I just put up, this is Ada Hawes Hinton and uh, they're a beautiful woman. And I show that I'm, I'm going to do more with her, but again, she was really the backbone of Hinton. She died a year before he did. And as Jane said, if she had been living what transpired after his death would never have happened. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson Thompson. Again, you know, I learned so much new about, about his. There are several questions in the Q&A relating to Tuskegee. And I think it's one of the more interesting questions that here was Hinton, perhaps the most prominent expert on the diagnosis of syphilis and its treatment in the country, who was a consultant for the public health service that was running the uh, study in, in Tuskegee. So he must have known about it. And, and yet you, you can't find any indication that he had any position on it or any indication from him that he knew about it. How do you, how do you read that? I read it as he probably did. He was probably providing all of the information and consultation. I will tell you this. I don't know if you know how information about the Tuskegee uh, case came to came to visi the visibility of all. So there was a young man who has since passed, and, and I knew him quite well, who uh, actually got his PhD in public health from UNC Chapel Hill. And he was a summer student working at the CDC. This was maybe 68, 69, 1968, 69. And for some reason, he was just going through files. He came across something that said Tuskegee. And he just dug into it and found out about the study. And he was the one who, in fact, I don't know who he told, but that was how the, the whole Tuskegee um, study came to light by public health officials. And then, as you know, it went on and on. And uh, finally, uh, Clinton gave an apology during his administration. And they also set up a bioethics institute at Tuskegee University. Now, the people at Tuskegee University always want to make it very clear that it was not Tuskegee University. This occurred in the city of Tuskegee. So there is so much unknown about um, Hinton and that's why I know your, your, your uh, work there where you are digitizing all of his papers. Hopefully we'll get some information out of that or it will lead to the location of other information. But when I really tried to delve into this more at CDC, I was told that I would have to just go to CDC and look up the records myself. 
I don't think I'll get to do that. Maybe somebody else will. <laughs> um, here's, a, here's, a, here's a quick question. Where, where is Dr. Hinton buried? He's buried in Canton. Yeah, from my understanding, in Canton, yes. Um, I, I had a question. You know, the Hintons were by no means wealthy. They were, you know, middle class, and um, but yet they sent their daughters to France to go to school. Yes, uh, that always sort of fascinated me, and, and and thinking about what what you know, it said that they were concerned they couldn't get an adequate education here. But there's no documentation of why they did it. How would you? Well, I can tell you what Jane Hinton told me. She was very, not only did, were they sent, and she didn't say France. So this is the first time saying that she said Europe with a white governess. And she said he just wanted to be white. He wanted to be white. And uh, that was part of the way he did it to raise them in a white environment. And other studies show that when he was at Harvard, he lived in, um, oh gosh, but it was a black neighborhood in Boston. And he moved to Canton, which was strictly uh, you know, a white environment. Now, he did have some black friends, a very interesting um, bundle of letters were received by the Canton Historical Society a few years ago. And they put, a, put these letters on their website. And it was, it was, the letters were from a niece of a couple who knew and visited Canton. And the, 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 the uh, male, the husband of the couple, was an artist, and I can't think of his name now, but I, I can send it to you. But he was a famous black artist, and they actually honeymooned at the at the Hinton's home. Uh, so he really he 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 really uh, didn't have too many black friends, but he did have some. You know, as you and I discussed, he had Fuller, who finished Harvard, Harvard, and he was the first. Black psychiatrist, I believe, to finish Harvard. And Judge Rivers, Judge Rivers was a good family friend. But at the same time, I can't even tell you that he had good white friends <laughs> because there's no documentation of that other than those he worked with in the lab. Um, there are a lot of questions here. Oh, one, uh, one follow-up. Um, Lucretia McClure passed away in 2019. Ah. And the Medical Library Association, this is from Cecilia, Cecilia Vernis, um, has an award called the Lucretia W. McClure Excellence in Education Award. Wow, so very some, good. Some recognition for that. Yes. Could you uh, tell us more about his relationship with uh, Lewis Tompkins Wright? Yes, apparently they were friendly. I don't know to what extent, um, because they had different lifestyles and different goals. Um, so I haven't seen that document. I know that, and you might've seen this too, Alfred, uh, there was an article in the Harvard Bulletin about the two. And they actually contrasted them. I'll tell you this, Lewis Wright appeared, well, Lewis Wright was very, very bright. He was accepted to Harvard, but when he got there, they realized that he did not go to Clark College in New England. He went to a little black school in Atlanta and they questioned his ability to, to do well, to, 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 to stay at Harvard. He was very outspoken, very adamant. He asked them, well, you know, do you want to test me? And they said, yes, they gave him an oral test and he passed it with flying 
colors. Not only did he pass it with flying colors, he graduated cum laude in his medical school. Now, I have looked at the, the commencement, or the, I should say the, gradu, the graduating seniors of the Harvard Medical School. All the information is right there. And it shows that uh, Wright finished cum laude. It does not show any uh, honors for William Hinton, even though during that class, they did identify honors. Now, whether that was an oversight, as was done with Ruth Moore, who's not listed as a graduate in the records. And when I asked the chairperson about Ruth Moore, why isn't she listed? She was probably the sixth person to get a PhD in bacteriology at that time from Ohio State. He said, oh, it's probably because you know, it was bacteriology then, and now we say mac microbiology, but that was not the case. So I don't know if Hinton's name was just left off as having graduated with honors, though we see in all the records that he graduated with honors, right? We see that. The... Um... Oh, it's an interesting question um, from Joe Bennett about, uh, you know, Hinton had this article in Ebony. Very, li very little else about him personally exists, but it generated an interest in, in Hinton and it was a source of information. Do you think from your experience in that realm that people should go back and read these old articles about people? and find out things that could be of interest now? I think so. I think so. In fact, and, and, and thank, I thank Jane, Joan. Joan was a great mentor to me, continues to be, and was really very helpful when I was pushing all of this uh, on Hinton. Joan is the former president of ASM. So yes, I think it's, it's very good because you get a different perspective. You can get a different perspective and there may be more honesty. And there may be more honesty in these kinds of articles because when you are being interviewed by a person who you feel looks, as the term goes, looks like you and share some of the same experiences, uh, you are more ready to to be honest and, and show some of your feelings. So for example, I had never heard that, uh, nowhere else did I see that Hinton had denied a deanship at Howard. Though, I mean, I can see where he was offered this because Montague Cobb, who was at uh, Howard at the time, thought so highly of Hinton I, I can see how, how they would have loved to have had Hinton. But once again, I think, which I haven't explicitly said, but I, I don't think Hinton, to him, that would not have been successful for him. His success came from being accepted by the white world. Um. There's a couple of questions here related to the, I, I think a lot of people were surprised to hear or interested in hearing that uh, he left he, he left his estate to Harvard for an Eisenhower uh, scholarship uh, and, and are, are wondering, you know, want to know more about that. Yes, yes. So according to Jane, I asked her, why I said, oh, and they named him Eisenhower. She said, and, and, and he wanted it named Eisenhower. And she said, oh, that was because the association of Dwight Eisenhower is because Eisenhower gave a speech once, maybe gave it there at Harvard, I don't know. But 
he cited William Hinton as a colored person who had pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. And James said that was the association. On the other hand, I want to bring to your attention that in Dr. Hinton's will, he said nothing about an Eisenhower scholarship. That, that was not in his will. He did leave everything. Well, let me say this. It's a very complicated piece of paper. He left everything to his executor, okay? Harvard's name is not in his will, it's to his executor. He left $1,000 to Jane and $1,000 to Anne. The rest went to Harvard. In the probate court readings, you see where all the furnishings, jewelry, silver, papers went to, went to his executor to dispense as they saw fit. He also said that he left some instructions for his executor to follow. The interesting thing about it, I'm not a, in fact, I wanted to check with my son, but the interesting thing about that, it seems as that that would have been required <laughs> in the will. <laughs> Just, I mean, but it wasn't. So she said, Jane said, he always wanted to please Harvard. He wanted to get recognition from Harvard. And this was his way of doing it. Well, it turns out that 60 years later, he has gotten recognition. <laughs> Took a long time and it did a lot to his family, uh, but he got the recognition. Was it worth it? To some, such as Dr. Hinton, he would say, yes, it's, it was worth it, yes. I remember talking to his grandson, Charles, when, they, when we named the building after him. And he, uh, he told, us, told me the story. He and his, they were living in New York and he and his sister, when he was young, and he and his sister would be put on a train uh, and sent up north from New York to Canton. And his grandfather would meet them at the station and they would all go to the farm, as he called it. Uh, and that's where they would spend their summers. That's that's interesting because I did not know of a sister. <laughs> well, I, maybe I'm getting the sister wrong. There, no, you're not right. <laughs> it was a sibling of some sort. It wasn't. It wasn't just him. Well, Jane mentions, um, and I don't think I have that in front of me. In one of her letters to me, she mentions a female, but she says it's her niece. And then this female is very estranged from the family. And she's trying to get this information to her so that maybe, you know, about uh, Hinton, so that it will stimulate her interest. And so I, the name, I, I have it somewhere here in the, in the note, but that might've been the person, I don't, I don't know. And it could have mm -hmm. been, um, it could have been, Anne Hinton's hus husband, maybe a, another child or either a niece. I would assume that's probably who it is. But she, she identified her as a niece. Um, the other thing, uh, Dr. Hinton used to um, volunteer at the hospital school, which is also in Canton. And mm -hmm. it would say, uh, it still exists as the Pappas Rehabilitation Hospital now. Uh, and it's basically a combination school and hospital for kids who physically have difficulties with attending regular school. So I, I think it's another interesting aspect because he, he somehow kept up his clinical skills over the years. Now, I think that's what I, I heard, the hospital for crippled children. That's what yeah. It was there. there was another hospital called that, but this was essentially 
a hospital for disabled crippled children. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we don't use crippled anymore, right? No. Right. Um, there was a question about uh, uh, Amy Thomas, who used to do the Hinton test um, in the lab, uh, asked about this, the South refusing to use the test after they found out who invented it. And that's pretty much all I know about it, but yeah. is there any, any other aspects of that you want to comment uh, on? No, nothing other than I did see I did see an article in Jet Magazine, which was another black magazine that's no longer in existing in existence. And it was uh, Ebony and Jet were owned by the same company, Johnson Publishing Company. And this this was just a small clip that said in 1944, on this day in 1944, all of the public health facilities in Maryland adopted the Hinton test, which I thought was quite interesting. But of course, that's not your deep south, right? <laughs> but Maryland is considered, what is it, below or above the Mason-Dixon line? It's, it's below, right? Yeah, it's just below. Right, right. Um... Some of this um, uh, Kate Fanoff um, is asking about is there any students working on Dr. Hinton? And this yeah. at least has been one. Aniel Rodriguez here at Harvard with Scott Podolsky has been working. There's an interesting story about Angel. Angel contacted me years ago because he was interested in doing some research that related to studies that occurred in Guatemala, wherein they use individuals in these tests. So I told him I didn't know about that, but I did know about William Hinton. <laughs> and we went through a long discussion. I think I even shared some information with him. And the next thing I knew, he had a paper out on William Hinton. And I think he's at the point of finishing up his, his PhD now. Yeah, no, he was referring to Susan Reverby's work on the Guatemala papers that okay, she found at the okay. University yeah. of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, here's, here's a, Maureen O'Dowd uh, is asking if you ever came across the name of John Joseph Carroll. He was the city bacteriologist for Holyoke. Many cities in Massachusetts had their own laboratories. Uh, and he worked with um, with Dr. Hinton on, uh, on, on syphilis venereal disease uh, and um, was friends with Dr. Hinton. I had never come across that name. No, I, I don't know that name. That's another in interesting aspect. You, you, you yeah. Run into these yeah. Interesting connections. I, do you have any other thoughts about the Davies articles that don't have yeah. Hinton? No, it was just interesting. And it was just interesting that the chapter talked about the Hinton, the Hinton Davies test. And then there were, now at the end of the chapter, there were references, there were three from Hinton, but there were two from Davies and it was just Davies alone. Now, the other interesting thing is, have you done a PubMed on Hinton recently? Right. If you do a PubMed, if you do a PubMed, do you know how many publications come up? I Three. found very, very Three. few, yeah, yeah. But Barbara Nabert's thesis lists almost 40. Now, it could be their book chapters, or I, I have not, gone into detail to look at that. Uh, but knowing your interests, uh, are you familiar with her thesis, Barbara Nabry? No, no. Yeah. I, uh... Well, it's there at the Countway Library. That's where I got it, I, you know. And uh, she, she uh, cited about, I think 38 
publications. And there's a publication with uh, one of the lab people that I showed. Uh, oh gosh, what's her name? Oh yeah, uh, Stuart. Um, Stuart, yeah, yeah, Stuart, Genevieve Stuart. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I yeah. Yeah, you know, we're, we're coming to the end here. I, I again, thank you very much. I also want to thank Amy Consalvi for her uh, mentorship, for uh, Amber, working with Amber on this project. Amber, again, did a great job of pulling together these papers. It, it wasn't easy. They're getting kind of flaky. Uh, they're drying out, and uh, we're going to be... Uh, for the time being, they're going to go to the Conway Library for uh, safe storage because we don't quite have the climate control right now that we should. So, but these will be available. The papers will be available um, in the public domain on our website uh, in the hopefully the near future. And thank you once again, Dr. Johnson Thompson. This has been. Great. It's always great to hear more about, about Hinton. He's he's like a mystery man in, in yes. a sense. And yeah. uh, every once in a while you come up with some new aspect of his life that's so interesting. So thank you again. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, please support the Public Health Museum. Thank you.